Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. In this week's episode, I'll be discussing some of the ethical, as well as some of the epistemic, actually, issues surrounding uh, disability. And I'll be joined in doing this by one of the world's um, leading thinkers and writers and speakers on the topic, who I'm very pleased to have on, uh, Tom Shakespeare, who's someone whose talks and so on I've been listening to for quite some time now. And um, I'm really excited to bring to all of you as a guest. So as a quick uh, bio, Tom Shakespeare is a fellow Brit. He uh, has a BA, MPhil, and PhD in social sciences from the University of Cambridge. His PhD research explored conceptualizations of disability and his subsequent research projects at the universities of Sunderland, Leeds, and Newcastle explored the sexual rights of disabled people, childhood disability, and the quality of life in restricted growth. He's published extensively in disability studies, uh, for example, The Sexual Politics of Disability in 1996, which we talk about a bit in this interview, as well as Disability Rights and Wrongs in 2006. He's also uh, written in Bioethics, for example, Arguing About Disability in 08. In addition to um, his work as an academic, Tom spent five years at the World Health Organization, where he co-authored the World Report on Disability in 2011, and International Perspectives on Spinal Cord Injury, in 2014. On top of that as well, he's um, been prominent in the public eye, um, particularly in the area of the arts. He served as a member of the Arts Council of England between 2003 and 2008, and he's presented programmes on BBC4 Radio, including A Point of View. He's also been a regular columnist for a number of publications, including The Guardian. Uh, Tom is currently Professor of Disability Research in the Medical Faculty of the University of East Anglia and is a member of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. In addition to all that, uh, Tom Shakespeare in 2018 was elected a Fellow of the British Academy. There's a lot more there, actually, and um, if you check out his website, which um, he plugs at the end, um, Tom's definitely someone who's really done an impressive amount in um, in his life. So I'm really excited to bring this guest to you. Just before we get to the interview, I'm actually not going to do my usual appeal this week. I'm going to do a thank you. I said in last week's opening, and I've been tweeting, that we've been on like 40-some patrons for a while now. Patrons, by the way, um, if you're new to the show, is just how we fund the podcast. Uh, We don't do any advertising or commercials or anything like that, because I think they break up the flow of podcasting and they honestly kind of um, diminish the credibility of the presenter sometimes, frankly. Um, And I just sort of got to tweeting, you know, hey, let's get to 50. Nice big round number, right? And I tweeted that a few times and within less than a day, like within a few hours, you all stepped up, and I got, I think, another seven people came on board and sponsored, and I sort of was tweeting out each time, two more to go, one more to go, um, whatever. So that's really, really terrific, and I'll forego my usual appeal for sponsorship to merely say thank you so much for doing that. That was, like, um, frickin' awesome. It really was, and, like... You know, if we can even just get like two, three percent of the listeners um, at this show sponsoring it, then that really is just going to make it a sustainable project um, for for the long run. And it was just great to see people step up when um, they didn't have to to just you know fund this obscure nerdy little thing that I do. So it made me really happy, and I'm just really grateful for people doing that. And I do have some thoughts on um, how I'm going to use that money to make the podcast better, which I hope to unveil in the coming months. So, thank you. That was absolutely terrific. Um, Yeah, so that's that. 
Um, that's my only sort of announcement. Um, yeah, so let's get straight to it. This is um, a discussion of the ethics and epistemology of disability with the wonderful Tom Shakespeare. I'm joined today by Tom Shakespeare. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So how do you self-describe for people who might not have heard of you before? I was reading your bio and some of your stuff on your sort of website stroke blog, and you've done a lot of stuff in your day. So what's your sort of like short potted history of who you are, what you've done, and what are the issues you think and write and talk about? Uh, my children once said that I talk bollocks for money. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I write and talk. Um, and obviously, I'm academic. I have a PhD. I've been reading and thinking uh, and writing about disability for more than 30 years. I also try to um, channel those ideas in different directions. So I've made a few artworks and written a bit and uh, made some radio programs. And I think it's very important that disabled people are not just limited to disability. So uh, on the radio, I try hard to talk about lots of other things, mainly around the arts. Uh, I've been very involved in arts organizations over the years. In disability, um, I suppose, uh, you know, I would say I do disability and. So uh, I started off thinking about how we think about disability. That was my PhD. And that led me into various avenues. Um, medical ethics, political philosophy. Um, I had to read and try and, um, as far as possible, get up to speed in some of that thinking. Uh, It took me into genetics and medicine. So obviously I had to spend time and try and understand those areas. Um, It took me into culture uh, and cultural representation of disabled people. I suppose in the last few years, it's taken me into psychology and mental health and trying to understand that. So I always feel that I'm on the back foot. I'm trying to catch up with vast bodies of literature in which my colleagues are expert and I am a beginner. So I'm, I'm very much a generalist. Um, you, you know, you, you call me a hedgehog, uh, well, a fox, not a hedgehog. Um, and uh, I'm always learning, which I think is really, really important. Um, I know some people do one thing and narrowly define it and go deeper and deeper and become the world scholars in that and i have great admiration for that course of action but i know a little about a lot great um i'm not an academic but i doing this podcast i i feel a similar way in that i i interview someone every week and i've got to try and bring myself up to speed with this particular field they might have and like the humblingness of going into something with someone who is a specialist and realising how much there is to know about a field is crazy, you know? Absolutely, and the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So uh, it it is very much that thing. Uh, I was one of the people who started the Café Scientifique Network, and the uh, Café Scientifique or Café Science have, uh, yeah, there's thousands of them throughout the world, and I hosted it for, for many years. And, of course, month by month, you met a... FRS scientists, you know, a world beating scientist, people who had Nobel Prizes occasionally, or, you know, just your local jogging scientist. And in each case, you had to learn a little bit about machine learning or about virology or about cosmology, just so that you didn't ask stupid questions and you didn't sound an idiot. But I still think that there is a great value in asking the obvious question. And when people are total specialists in something they may not see that obvious question and it it might be important and these interconnect i mean i'm not as far from a scientist as you're gonna get but certainly in the social sciences if you can use that term if you have something you want to study like disability say then that's necessarily gonna be in like this huge venn diagram with just like everything else basically. And if you want to 
you'll, you'll necessarily find yourself pulled down all sorts of different avenues to consider all of the different dimensions to a particular social category or concept or so on. I, I think I think there's an unavoidable need in the social sciences for that. I think I think I think it's I I would go a bit. I think it's everywhere, but I, certainly in the social sciences, human phenomena are so complicated and multi-faceted. Uh, um, uh, the late Mary Midgley, who I loved very much, um, once said that it was uh, these uh, approaches to understanding. She said it was like one aquarium, many windows. And I think I think you could call that ontological holism and epistemological pluralism if you're being technical about it. But I think we we look at this with different lenses or through from different perspectives. But fundamentally, it's the same thing. Um, and when I think about disability, basically, traditionally, disability was always seen as just the 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 functional aspect of uh, medical problems of deficit body or mind. And that's been called, although people who expound this approach don't call themselves medical model, it's been called medical model. And it was radically challenged in the late 70s by disabled people themselves who said, no, that was wrong. Disability was fundamentally social. So people were disabled by society, not by their bodies. And this has become known as the social model. And it's been very radical, very, very helpful. And it highlights um, the areas of the world that we need to change. And it also is very empowering for people to relocate the problem from them, from their bodies or minds, to society. So that's another reason it's been so successful. I would say that both this, if you like, medical model and the social model are wrong because disability, like all the phenomena you describe, is multidimensional. It does have a medical component a genetic component, a psychological component, but it also vitally has, you know, it's about architecture and it's about social policy and it's about law and it's culture. So that's why, I mean, the critical realists, for example, talk about a laminated view of reality. And this idea that, you know, the one phenomena has many different dimensions. And, you know, it's true to say I have a G to A transposition at 0.38 of my FGFR3 gene. But that's not how you introduced me at the top of this podcast. You know, you, you wanted me to talk about my intellectual interests or my career pattern, none of which really is explained by my um, single gene uh, mutation. So both are true. One is more helpful in this uh, interview. So let me see if I can summarise the difference between, um, as you call it, the medical approach. Although I think that's a label it's been given. I don't think anyone yeah, puts their hands yeah. up and says that. It, 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 it's a slur word as well. I mean, it's sort of you terrible biological determinists out there. Well, very few people are quite like that. Yeah, I'm sort of reminded of various issues we talk about with trans people and so on, and there's different labels we attach to views we want to track. But just to track the medical versus social model, if I'm understanding this right, it's a bit like the difference between saying, how has your life been negatively or positively impacted by your disability, and saying, how has your life been impacted by society's preconceptions of your disability and their differential treatment of you because of it. So it's a shift from talking about it about you to talking about it as the way society relates to you. Did I track that right? Yes. It's not just attitudes. It's also physical barriers. Yeah, It could be something as simple as the fact that the buses in your town are not wheelchair accessible or um, you know, everybody uses the telephone, but you use sign language and there is no provision for you. So it's, it's not just um, attitudes, it's material, it's real. It's about poverty. And if the poverty of disabled people derives from the fact that they are excluded from employment and they don't get decent welfare benefits, they're not upgraded, um, then, you know, that's a social issue. And it's certainly not a medical one. So... One reason I could think of, and I'm not an expert on this, so correct me, but one reason I can think of, a historical reason, um, that disabled people might be um, strongly uncomfortable with a medical approach, is it wasn't that long ago 
that um, a lot of the people talking about disabled people as well as people of other races and so on were overt eugenicists who believed stuff that hopefully most of us don't believe today. And I remember in one of your talks you went into a little bit of um, the history of how not just, you know, fascists, but conservatives, liberals, people across the spectrum, you know, less than a hundred years ago were really both feet in on all of this stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, this, this idea, eugenics, started in the 1870s. Francis Galton, who coined the word, was the cousin of Darwin. Um, and it was a fashion. It was extremely powerful fashion. Um, as you say, uh, progressive people like H.G. Wells, uh, uh, Virginia Woolf, um, a whole uh, a bunch of progressive social thinkers, the Myrdals uh, in, in, in the Nordic countries, and so forth, were enthusiasts for eugenics, as well as people on the right, like Winston Churchill. Uh, and today we're talking about things like um, who gets ventilators uh, in the COVID-19 crisis, and eugenic ideas are being perpetrated, are being promoted. Um, uh, uh, is it Alabama, where um, they've made it quite clear that no, no older or disabled people are going to get a chance for these ventilators? So, you know, it's not there about clinical survival potential. It's about you are not worth it. And that is the eugenic thought, that certain people are not worth it, that they should be stopped from reproducing, i.e. sterilized. Uh, and, you know, in the worst case, in Nazi Germany, literally murdered. And, you know, over 300,000 people were murdered by the Nazis who were disabled. They were mentally ill or they had intellectual disabilities or other hereditary issues, apparently, and they were just killed. So children and adults. So you can see why there is there is concern. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. We, in 1996, we were doing a book about sexuality and disability, and somebody told me uh, they'd been in a supermarket with another disabled person, and they'd kissed them, and somebody passing them had said, do you mind it's bad enough that there are two of you. Um, yeah, there is, there is a negativity. You know, fascists attack disabled people sometimes in eastern Germany. You know, these are still there, um, sadly, uh, even though disabled people have demonstrated that they can achieve in all areas of life, they're still seen as second-class citizens. Could you maybe actually um, say a few words about disability and sexuality? Because I think, and I am not endorsing this view in any way, but I think the sort of eugenicist view has a certain um, lack of comfortability with disabled people having children. The idea is we sort of want to breed out what they would say is are defects. But there's also a sort of more general unease about disability and sex in general, like people either assume it just doesn't happen at all, or they um, have some sort of weird stigma about it, which I guess I just don't really share. Could you maybe say a few words about that, both the sort of preconceptions and the reality? Yes, indeed. And um, I think that the, the, uh, the thing that the, the, and the biological, the medical thing to say about disability is that yeah, a very small proportion of it is uh, congenital. You know, one or two percent of babies are born with conditions. Um, so, you know, disability in society is not about disabled people reproducing and having more disabled children. It's just not. Um, so even my condition, which is totally genetic, uh, achondroplasia, as I've mentioned, 60 um, percent of uh, babies with achondroplasia are new mutations. They are Random, spontaneous mutations, usually in the father's sperm. So, you know, this is not, you know, disabled people having loads of children. Um, secondly, most disability, the, there's something like 15% of the population are disabled. Contrast that with the two or one or two percent that I said were born with it. A lot of disability is to do with, is acquired through life with uh, traumatic accidents like spinal cord injury. Uh, and mostly with the things you develop, like arthritis, rheumatism, uh, strokes, um, multiple sclerosis, all of these things are later onset conditions. 
and they're mostly nothing to do with genetic. So you can't read it out. That's the first thing. Um, you asked about sexuality and disability, and I think you're right. There is a taboo. People feel that disabled people, you know, a sort of innocent, childlike people who uh, like old. Yeah, we don't think older people have sex, which is clearly, you know, just wrong in every respect. Similarly, disabled people are the same. We feel that if we look after people, if they are um, dependent in any way, they can't therefore have a sex life. Um, it's almost like there are two boxes in, in, in our mind or in our culture, one for people who need help and one for people who are sexually active. It, sex is almost, and that's why, you know, we, we find the sexuality of children um, very um, disturbing. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's what Freud said. You know, it, 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 we don't feel they should have sexuality. But clearly they do have something going on there. And, you know, it, it, it's it's for them, but it might be important. Um, so disabled people um, uh, seem to have uh, uh, partners in the same proportion, not in the same proportion, that's not true, but to a considerable extent. All the data is that, you know, they, they keep on having sex and they... Uh, form sexual relationships, um, and, uh, you know, they're like everybody else. Um, the research that we did, some of the research we did, points to the fact that, for example, um, if you are disabled, you are somewhat liberated from gender and sexuality norms. So there may be a view in a Western society uh, 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 um, that disabled, that people, sorry, uh, particularly men have to be in a certain way, women have to be in a certain way, this is how you do male heterosexuality and so forth. Now, disabled people often cannot aspire to those norms. And so, paradoxically, they can be liberated from it. So when we did research in, um, uh, in Australia, we, we analysed data which showed that um, disabled, oh, sorry, yeah, disabled men were much more likely to be um, gay or bisexual or actually asexual. Yeah, they were more likely to be not the sexual majority. Um, and uh, that they, many of them did not try to um, uh, aspire to this norm of independent masculinity, you know, the powerful norm of uh, what a man is meant to be. And those that did had far more mental health issues. And the reason is because they were trying to, you know, we think, because they were trying to aspire to something that was unattainable. But it's not just them who have mental health issues. You know, that's, that's you know, this difficulty in being a man um, is widespread. So uh, to reiterate, disabled people do have relationships, they do have children. Often what we did and when we did our book in 1996, we said that the problem of disabled sexuality was not how to do it, but who to do it with. That is to say, it's often medicalized, more medical model. They, you know, let's talk about erectile dysfunction and the drugs that we can give you to deal with that. But actually, like with everybody, it's often to do with isolation or meeting people or, you know, for disabled people, yeah, they don't, they don't always go to college. They don't always go to work. And the places that people meet partners are college and work. Um, they may not have money to go to fancy restaurants, bars or clubs. Those are places you take people or meet people. They may not have money to um, buy the clothes that suit you, especially if you need the clothes specially made or altered. So all of these things make it harder for disabled people to project themselves as confident sexual beings. Um, and we know that, you know, a lot of, of sexuality, a lot of meeting people and having relationships is about this confidence. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, if we are f systematically denying disabled people that, undermining that, it will be harder. But those are not medical issues. They're not biological issues. They are social and cultural and psychological and we can do something about it, and we should. So, for example, on the uh, television now, there's this um, series, uh, The Undateables. And it's a, it's a terrible name, but it's an interesting premise that actually, you know, we can support people often there with autism or intellectual disability. We can support people to meet the partner that's right for them and to have a relationship with them. Um, and, you know, it's a bit patronising and sentimental, you know, stories, but... Um, the message is important, which is why not? Really, what we would want is that show to be integrated within a dating show, because why, why, why do you have to have a special segregated show for 
disabled people dating? Why can't they be the same with everybody else? And that, I think, is what we're trying to say in every walk of life. Disabled people are more like everybody else than different. Um, we should uh, open that up. We should, as you said at the beginning of this uh, this part, is think about why we're prejudiced about disabled people having sex or disabled people uh, being romantically interested. It was, it was very interesting. I was in Malta talking about disability and, in fact, disability and sexuality. And two ladies who were mothers of uh, y- y- young people in their teens with Down syndrome came up to me. And they made the point that each of them, at every stage of life, had tried to support inclusion for their child in school and in, and in you know, everyday neighborhood events and all the rest of it. Now their young people were 18 or whatever age they were, and they'd fallen in love with each other. So two people with Down syndrome were boyfriend and girlfriend. And they said, well, we, we, we feel anxious about this. We, you know, and I said, why? And they said, well, because if you're boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, you might want to, you know, make love, have sex. And I said, yes. And you might want to get married. And I said, yes. And they had come up against a wall of their, their anxiety. Um, that They wanted normality in every area of life, but they were worried about this one. And maybe everybody is worried about sexuality. I think they probably are. There are taboos for everybody. And this is interesting when we do global work about disability and sexuality. We have to remember that, you know, everybody, uh, you know, in that society may find it difficult to talk about sex. That's normal in that society. Um, but, uh, you know, we, if we have normalization in every area of life, we should have it in the area of sex and relationships. And many of the laws that are around the world actually prohibit the marriage of disabled people or people with intellectual disabilities. Um, many of the, um, I don't know, support systems. You know, if you're in a, a, um, a uh, you know, congregate living facility, all the rooms are single. You, you know, the idea that you would want to, to get together with somebody in your, in your building is, is not, you know, possible. Whereas, you know, most of us, I'm looking at your double bed, I've got a double bed, most adults probably... Have I, I have a lot of pride in my double bed, I spent an, bed. an unconscionable amount of money on that mattress and expensive it's, pillows and... I... Well, it's a lovely bed. <laughs> the, the point is, it's not a single bed, and nor yeah. is my bed a single bed. But yet, many disabled people sleep in single beds, and it's presumed that that's all that they want. And they go on, I don't know, disabled transport where they're taken somewhere nice and they come back from somewhere nice, but the idea that they might meet somebody and want to take them home with them, no, we won't have that. So it's outdated. I think it is changing. It needs to change more. Yeah. So a thought just... Thank you for that, by the way. That was great. Um, I think one thought that occurs to me is I try to be fairly politically open-minded and see the other person's point of view. The one people I just cannot put myself in the head in are sort of like extreme rights, men's rights activists types who like think feminism is a conspiracy to stop them getting laid, essentially. And it just makes me think, like, if you're a healthy, able-bodied white man who sort of has all the vectors of, like, social non-discrimination and you're whinging about, like, how society's conspiring against you to to stop you having the sorts of relationships you want. It's just so lacking in self-awareness when there's so many people, groups in society, who have genuine social stigmas and barriers to them expressing their sexuality how they want to. Not just disabled people, you could talk about gay people or trans people or have you, right? And then you've got these just entitled little fuckwits who can just not see beyond their own frustrated aspirations of manhood. Anyway, that was yeah. a complete uh, aside. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, uh, I remember when I used to live in Newcastle, um, and... I are, you, was, are you still are you still a Newcastle fan, by the way? You were last oh, yeah. time we met. Very, okay. much so. very much so. Um, so we first met in Newcastle, of course, um, and uh, the, in Newcastle there's a great group called... Um, uh, 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 the Lormers, and they're a theatre group of people with uh, intellectual disabilities. And I, I moved up to the northeast in about 1991, and um, I knew them from there. So they're still there. There's another generation of the Lormers coming through. Um, but what, why I mention them is because they ran this great uh, nightclub, essentially, called the Crocodile Club. 
Um, and uh, they were the DJs, Crocodile Crew. And, you know, they spun the discs or whatever you do these days, showing my age. Um, and uh, they danced and they, you know, flirted with each other and snogged in the corner and do what anybody else presumably does at a night club. Um, and it was, I went, you know, once or twice and it was great. It wasn't late at night. There wasn't a lot of alcohol. I certainly don't think there were any drugs. Um, but it was uh, relaxed and fun. And why the hell not? Um, and, and I think one of the reasons that they organized this is because many of the people in their group had been uh, excluded from um, uh, uh, regular uh, uh, nightclubs, didn't feel welcome. And there was something about being with other folk like them and not being judged, which was extraordinarily uh, um, positive for them. And it was just a joyous event. And it was quite interesting because I went and uh, this was before I was in a wheelchair and I danced and I had fun uh, with folk. And some people had gone there with their support workers. And I saw this bunch of support workers sitting on the side having a drink or a cigarette or whatever they were allowed to do in those days um, and not joining in and having a laugh, you know, laughing at people. And I thought, what on earth? You know, why, why can't, yeah, this is fun. This is, you know, the, people are welcoming us into their space for a change. And, um, you know, why can't we let our side down? And I think part of it was because they didn't, they wanted to maintain separateness. And I've worked, I've worked with people with intellectual disabilities. I've worked in, in hospitals where I've noticed that some of the staff really try to maintain their separateness from the people they're working with, almost as if intellectual disability is contagious. And I think there's still this stigma. You know, I might work with them, but I'm not like them. Oh, I, you know, I drink out of separate mugs, um, this sort of thing. And I, I think we just have to try and change that mentality um, and just recognize human beings, uh, whether they have mental health issues or intellectual disability or autism or whatever else. We're all human beings. Uh, in the long run, you know, there's an Italian proverb. Um, at the end of the day, the, the, the pawn and the king go back in the same box. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that perspective, which I'd associate, you know, Spinoza talks about subspecies eternitatis, you know, from the distant view, from the view of uh, eternity, you know, we're all nothing. Um, and so why are we hung up with these, you know, fairly minor differences between people whose loves, uh, uh, worries, um, uh, aspirations, you know, they're, they're comparable, they're fundamentally comparable. So you can broaden that thought out to just everything, right? Is that, you know, I think the impulse behind um, the eugenicist view with which we started is that um, life being disabled um, must just be so unconscionably awful that it would be... A, a, you, you quoted in one of your talks, I think it was Virginia Woolf looking at mentally disabled people, and saying perhaps they should, it would just be better if they were all killed. And that's a sentiment a lot of people have had. Um, but it's sort of just based on a falsehood, right? Is that, well, I'll, I'll just put the question to you, is that you presented a lot of data in a lot of your talks that actually if you just ask people and look at what they do with their lives and ask if they're happy and if they find meaning and so on, you don't necessarily see huge differences between disabled and non-disabled people. Could you talk us through that? Yeah, indeed, indeed. And, you know, that, I included that quote from Virginia Woolf. I actually love Virginia Woolf. I mm. love her novels. You know, I'm a total fanboy of Virginia Woolf. Uh, but I was trying to illustrate that even our heroes say some tr truly uh, uh, dreadful things. Um, I think it's partly a sort of aesthetic revulsion, um, I, you know, the, oh my goodness, these people turn my stomach type thing. And it's partly, as you say, a more rational thought that people must be unhappy to be disabled. Um, and as you say, it's just not true. There was a, a really important paper by Albrecht and Bledlinger, and they did a study of people with disabilities, and they found that, you know, far more than half of them said they had a good quality of life. And, you know, actually, if you ask the general public, you know, they don't come out much better, if, better at all. Um, what changed for these people that made life difficult was pain. So assuming you don't have pain, which does make life really miserable, 
um, you have a good quality of life. The Scott Co, um, Brian Scott Co in, uh, uh, Co in, in America did a study with people with Down syndrome and their families. And again, he found that the 99% of them enjoyed their life, enjoyed having a disabled family member, enjoyed being who they were. Yeah, it's just not true that people are unhappy. Uh, the, you know, the vast majority of people with disabilities are as happy or perhaps more happy. Um, yeah, because if you have disability, you do have to put things in perspective. You do have to accept your limitations. You are liberated from some of these unrealistic expectations, which makes life easier. Um, so there was a very good paper by Katrina McKenzie and Jackie Leach Scully, and it talked about the danger of imagination. And, the, and what they were trying to say is that when we think of people whose lives we do not share, we use our imagination. We think, oh, it must be terrible to be that person. If I was that person, I would not be happy. And therefore, you then project, well, if I think I would not be happy to be them, they can't be happy to be them. But, you know, that's obviously a fallacy. Um, you're not them. You haven't lived with this all your life. And we could think of people born with a condition. They know no other thing. This is all they're used to. And people are happy. You could think of people who newly acquire a condition. And you're right. At, 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 or they're right. At the start, you have this plunge in your quality of life. You feel really, you know, miserable about, for example, breaking your back or losing your sight. But then you adapt, and human beings adapt amazingly to all sorts of things. Um, and a colleague of mine called Ron Amundsen has looked at the literature in this field, which is called hedonic psychology. Yeah, he finds that finds that basically, you know, your 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 quality of life will plummet and come back up to what you were before. Um, and this happens if you have a negative thing like you know, an injury, or a positive thing like winning the lottery. Yeah, you feel great if you win a lottery, but it comes back to what you were before. You re revert to your average. Um, there's a sort of reversion to the mean. Um, so this thought that disabled people must be miserable uh, uh, because they lack something is, isn't true. Um, and I, I mean, it, it, I didn't think my friend was miserable, but I did wonder about this um, you know, I've been, uh, you know, restricted growth to autism all my life, and I became spinally cord injured 10 years ago and used a wheelchair. And I was in Germany and visiting a friend of mine who has no arms. And I was doing a lecture for her students, uh, and that all fi went fine, I think. Um, and then after she said, I'll drive you to the restaurant we're going to tonight, at, at your hotel or whatever it was. And at this point, I'll be frank with you, I was anxious. I thought, this woman has no arms. Surely she means we'll get a taxi. She can't drive us. And I, you know, I have had, you know, my lifetime experience of disability. And yet I used my imagination and I thought if I had no arms, I could not drive. This woman has no arms. Therefore, she cannot drive. And in offering to drive me home, this is clearly suicidal. And of course, we got into her car and she drove with her feet as she did everything, as she brought up two children, as she'd become a law professor, as she'd cooked meals, as she'd done everything, she was totally, obviously capable of it. So this was a failure of my imagination. I had projected from the little I knew and the little I had experienced to think that I knew about her life. And I think this is what happens on a big scale with people thinking that disabled people must be miserable. But we're not. And the final thing I would add is, you know, I told you I'd been reading more psychology. There's this notion in psychology by a, a woman called uh, uh, Marston, Anne Marston, um, where she, the phrase she uses is ordinary magic. And what she's saying is the resilience, uh, the capacity to withstand negative shocks, is not about some exceptional people. It's an ordinary magic that all human beings have. Everybody has the capability of dealing with difficulty. Um, and what it's about is adaptation, this amazing human ability to adapt and to make the most of things, 
and to seek the joys that you can have and to um, do things differently. And disabled people are expert at this. We do it in all of our lives. Um, uh, 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 there was a, a very famous paper about inspiration porn, this danger that we have of thinking that disabled people are marvellous because they can do these things and how incredible it is. We overpraise minor achievements because we think that disabled people are rubbish, that they can't do a thing, and therefore if they do anything, it's amazing. How and it's kind of this well-done-you sort oh. of done for going to school well done for you know doing all these things uh, yeah it, it's just ludicrous and the issue is that we think that disabled people can't do anything and that's why we feel they deserve praise for tiny things but it's all back let's go back to the fact that if you became disabled you would cope uh, if you were if your child was disabled they would cope people thrive in all sorts of circumstances and disability is not incompatible with achievement uh, you know i did a whole website full of 50 or more disabled people who had achieved great things and it wasn't hard to find them it was harder to find disabled women because generally in history men are more famous but i found loads of those as well um who women and men who had achieved great things um, you know, Florence Nightingale, she was the pioneer, not of a nursing, but of, 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 of um, public health. She was an extraordinary statistician. Uh, and she did it all while an invalid, while having maybe um, CFS ME or something similar to that. She was confined to bed for decades and yet corresponded and analysed and produced great work. So, you know, it, it, there's so many people uh, uh, who, who, who did great things. Um, who, with disability, not despite it, but just with it, you know, it just was part of their life. So a thought, on, a thought and a question, and feel free to take me up on either. The thought is, I actually find this, the word inspiring can sometimes be associated with the sort of like achievement porn that you talk about, um, but just quite an empowering thought is sort of this idea of like, bad things might be coming in your life, you might get injured, other things might happen that prevent you from pursuing certain goals or living your life how you want to, and you'll be okay. Not because you will prove yourself to be this extraordinary superman who conquers these unconquerable obstacles, because you don't know in advance if you are capable of being that type of person, but actually precisely the reverse. You'll be okay because you're ordinary. You're an ordinary yeah. human, and ordinary humans are really adaptable. And I just find that so much more empowering, because let's just assume something I didn't plan or expect or necessarily want does happen in my life. Well, I, I don't need to assume that I'll be extraordinary. It's just this idea that people... People adapt, people get on, people work it out, you know? And I just find that a much more just, like, empowering way to look at the world than assuming these sort of, like, heroic myth of individuals standing out and conquering it, you know? Um, the, the, the question I had is, um, what, one issue I've spent a bit of time with on the podcast is... Um, this idea from, like, social justice theory of um, standpoint epistemology. So the idea that, say, like, if you're white, there's probably a certain set of knowledge and experience and so on that you're missing out on not having um, lived in a social world quite heavily structured by racism. And I've heard quite a few people be really, really critical of this. And certainly you could take it to an extreme place where it becomes quite reductive and reduces everything to these categories. But my thought would be something like what we've just talked about would actually be a perfect case of standpoint epistemology, in that if you just ask non-disabled people about the lives of disabled people, not only do they not know, they have a sort of, like, n negative knowledge. They, they assume a bunch of stuff that isn't the case, and th this would strike me as a perfect instance of just, you don't have to make it big or fancy or metaphysically complex, but just a perfect instance of this idea that you don't necessarily know other people's lives, and if you're going to make political pronouncements about disability or race or gender, 
you probably want to start by listening to people who have lived those lives. Does so? So, what's your take on the, the standpoint epistemology thing? No, I, I, t- I tend to agree with it. I mean, my point that that that, that, that Jackie Lee Scully point about uh, imagination is evidence of that. You know, non-disabled people imagine things. I think that relatives, you know, mothers, fathers, siblings of disabled people, you know, learn a lot about what it means to be disabled. Uh, not everything, but a lot. So I, th- I don't think it's inevitable that people don't know. They can learn. They can spend time. But as you say, it's about listening to and making space for the voices of disabled people. Let's let's have more space in public discourse, in academic discourse, in research, for the perspectives of disabled people to emerge. I, I My great news this week is that a bunch of people with dementia have chosen me to write a paper with them. Um, and I'm really pleased. Uh, uh, be, but it's going to be, it's not going to be co-production. I'm going to be facilitating them. They're going to say what the paper should contain. I will probably write most of it. They will approve it. They will discuss it. I will hear what they say. I'm just charging up my recorder so I can record what they say. But it, 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 you know, they are people with dementia who have experiences I do not know. And it would be arrogant of me to assume that I know what their lives are like. Just as, you know, I, I don't know what women's lives are like. You know, really, I don't. Uh, it was very interesting. I was talking to my partner yesterday and i can't remember what i was saying but i was saying something about how you know i've i've you know had lots of friends uh you know strangers who i've met who are women who i've become friendly with um and she said you know women are used to men being vile and pursuing them and wanting dates and i don't know sending them pictures of their penis or whatever it might be and i said well i don't do any of that and she said no but they will be used to it and they will expect it, and they will avoid you, and they will fear that your friendly overtones to them, overtures to them, will be followed by something like this. And I had no idea. I was just thought I was gender blind, that I was just being friendly to men and women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what I wasn't perceiving was that my friendliness towards a particular, you know, woman or women was not in was was already uh, worrying or threatening or whatever. And she's and my my partner said, just you've got to leave people alone. You've got to let them be friends with you if they want to be. But if you are, uh, you know, uh, too uh, pushy, they will think you're one of these vile people who pursue them and harass them. And and that was a very ch- challenging thought to me. And I thought, and I think she's probably right. Well, I'm sure she's right. But more to the point, in your uh, angle of, of question or discussion is that we do not know what it is like to be, I don't know, women on the internet or disabled people or people with intellectual disabilities. All we can do is try and make space and listen and do the research and read the first-person accounts and, uh, and, then, and think, oh, my goodness, yes, from that perspective, this would look very wrong or sound very bad. And it's not about my intentions it's about how people receive what you're saying. Um, and, I, and I think uh, uh, we've got to try and put ourselves in the other person's shoes. We've, and, and the best way of doing that is listening to what they have to say. Yeah. So I've, I've heard a lot of people really criticise this, um, both from the left and the right, actually, in the ways that I think are criticising a sort of extreme version of it, or like a straw man, and they say you're reducing everything to sex, or you're reducing everything to gender, or they say, you know, just because you're white, it doesn't mean you can't learn facts about racism or whatever, and that's true enough as an object-level fact. Um, But, I mean, sure, if you try to reduce the whole world to that sort of analysis, you'll definitely run into blind spots. You talk about lenses of interpretation we have. I I think about them as like different pairs of glasses you put on to see the world. And I think this sort of like intersectional framework, if you can call it that, or something like that, or 
um, th this idea of standpoint epistemology is a particular interpretive lens. It won't show you everything about the world, but it will show you stuff that other lenses don't. And the thought isn't crazy, and maybe we can do a better job of, like, explaining it and not using jargon and talking simply and plainly about putting yourself in someone else's shoes, listening to what they say, realising you haven't lived the same life as them, as opposed to maybe using words that seem to turn people off, like privilege or intersectionality or so on. But then I sometimes think that maybe people just want to be turned off by it because they actually resent being asked to listen. Yes, I'm afraid that may well be right. Um, I, and I think um, I would make three points. Mm. One is, I, you, know, I, 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 you know, I do think we're all in the same game together. We're trying to get, I don't think there are sort of different knowledges. And, you know, I think there is one knowledge. You know, no, no, I is, agree with that, yeah. There's, there's one truth. Yeah, I'm not saying we attain it. And it, I, I do think popper and falsifiability and all the rest of it. But we're trying to get closer and closer to the truth. So I don't think there's sort of women's truth and men's truth and black folks' truth and white folks' truth. But, you know, as you say, there are, th there are blind spots. There are things we don't see. There are spectacles we haven't got. And so we need different people to contribute towards creating that or, 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 or uh, understanding that uh, truth. Um, uh, I think the other thing I would say is uh, about identity. I think that these debates get mixed up with identity politics. And I, I, am, I don't like identity politics um, uh, in the sense that it's about, sometimes it's about trying to favour or support a group um, and our group and the in-group and the out-group and all these group things, which I find destructive, I find them liable to lead to segregation, um, uh, to, to sort of internal rancor. I think you're about to ask me what's the alternative. Um, and I would go uh, uh, to Nancy Fraser. And Nancy Fraser talks about what we want is for an individual woman and man or individual disabled person and non-disabled person to have parity of esteem. She wants us to be equal with each other. It's not that you have to, you know, give special privilege to a group it's that you have to say look we should all count we should all count equally and we should all be treated with respect and listened to you know in a, in a democracy um and that's what we want and it's interesting in the disability world i don't think our goal is to support you know disabled people's organizations for the sake of it i think it's a means to an end what we want is for disabled people to have the same choices as everybody else and to be treated as equals to non-disabled people. And disabled people's organizations are a very good way of promoting that equality, of boosting the status and so forth. But it's not them that we're trying to support. It's the individuals with disabilities. And similarly, men and women and people from different uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds and, and so forth. So when identity politics gets mixed up with this very important point about uh, white folk can't see everything, non-disabled folk are missing things. You, you, you see why I think people's backs go up and they start getting defensive and they start saying, oh, well, you know, this is just feminism or this is just, you know, whatever. So I, I do think it's, it, it gets complicated with a few other things. There's certainly, uh, what I was actually going to ask was, um, could you give me an example of like what, what that identity politics looks like to you? Because I agree there are um, sort of like separatist strains of thought out there. Um, that, well, well, let's just could you give me like an example, either real or just hypothetical, of like yeah. what that what that would look like, uh, what identity politics looks like there in that sentence? Yeah, and and obviously my main experience is of disability politics. So you know, uh, I I right at the outset of this conversation, I said, look, the medical model. You know, it, it's a bit of a slow word, but you know, isn't sufficient. And I said the social model isn't sufficient. And what we really need is a mixture of things. Well, back in the early 1990s, I criticised the social model, not just me, other people too. And my goodness, it, you know, it set off the cat among the pigeons. The you know, disability rights folks were really upset because they thought that by criticising the social model, I was saying, oh well. Yeah, it's all medical. It's not social. I wasn't saying that at all. 
And I've never said that. And you've heard what I say in this interview. Um, but I, I really was a bit of a pariah in the disabled people's movement. Then, you know, I started working on bioethics. And, you know, I, I, again, I became a pariah because I was asking questions, difficult questions, and having, I hope, reasonable, evidence-based discussions about them. And again, I mean, people said, oh, you're no better than Peter Singer. You just want us all dead. You know, this sort of nonsense. Um, and it was it was very painful. It's very hurtful. And I think this came from identity politics because I think with the dominance of identity politics, it's very difficult to have a debate. You work out your view, you work out your line, and then people who deviate from it are traitors. They have to be expelled. They have to be attacked. Um, and uh, yeah, that I re I want people to debate. I, I don't care if you think I'm wrong. I want to hear why you think I'm wrong, and I will change my view when you persuade me. And I'm open to being persuaded because none of us are right. We're all doing our best to move a bit closer to the truth, and we all make mistakes. And I've made loads of mistakes, and people have pointed it out, and I've felt terrible and tried to correct my thinking for future uh, rounds of the argument. Um, but if we ever stop being open to that challenge, that criticism, that debate, then we are really in trouble. And this is, I think, something that identity politics does. It does freeze the argument and say, this is right, this is wrong. If you say this, you're wrong. If you say this, and you know, in the world of Twitter, it's become a, an, an instant rebuttal. It's become even more so. Um, so I think these are concrete examples of how I would say identity politics leads you into saying, you know, if you're attacking this idea, you're attacking me. And and I, I think I can disagree with you fundamentally, but not attack you. Um, and and that's if in identity politics, that's not always the case, because if I disagree with you, I must be undermining you or saying you don't deserve to exist or, or criticizing you in some other way. I'm not. I'm talking about the arguments. Yeah. So here's here's how I see this is. I think we do have these, let's use the, the metaphor of lenses, glasses that we, we look at the world through different foundational frameworks, different methodologies, um, different political ideologies, right? Now, to say that isn't to say that um, there's no objective truth to be had. There's all sorts of different facts about the world that we can be fairly um, confident about, but in our interpretation of those facts, in uh, us bringing together various bits of data for the world and presenting a story about it, that's necessarily going to be an interpretive act, and there's various different ways that you can do that. And I think anyone, not just like, I see this on so many different parts of the left, actually, um, is they get locked into one particular interpretive frame, and anything that seems to be contradicting that or pushing back on it, you sort of become an ideological enemy. And so the sort of, should we call it the, the intersectional or whatever frame, there's people within that who just cannot hear that there are other frames out there. And other frames that aren't diametrically opposed even to that frame. They just, they sometimes pull together, they sometimes pull apart. I see it also with the sort of hardcore socialist economic justice people, in, in that if you want to sort of say there are aspects of the interaction with economics and race, or something like that, that your story isn't picking up on or giving sufficient weight to, you sort of become an enemy. And they say stuff like, you know, oh, I'm sorry you're concerned about, like, the sexism of some supporters, but, like, people are dying because of healthcare and you, you're making that okay. And it's like, of course, I, I wasn't even talking about healthcare. But it's just, I think if there's one thing I'd like to see on the different elements of the left... It's an ability to think with more than one frame. And, you know, that doesn't mean you're not going to have a favourite frame. And, and me sort of bringing in another frame is not to say you have to abandon your original one. It's just a sort of very classical liberalism in the best sense of that tradition, an idea of, 
thinking critically and being open to new ideas. And I definitely see that on the social justice left. I see it on other parts of the left too. And it's immensely frustrating to be on the other side of it. I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, no arguments to that. Um, and this is why, uh, you know, uh, among the philosophers that I've read, I have a lot of time for Bernard Williams. Bernard Williams talks about the fact that we can't just have this abstract um, world of ideas. People are people. And he talks about psychology. And he talks about uh, understanding that, you know, there, there might be certain positions which people just can't live with. They just can't do. And therefore, you know, it may be right in some platonic universe, you know, of abstract ideas, but it can't work at the level of human beings because human beings aren't like that. Um, and, and I do think that we need to take into account this psychology if we're to make better arguments about how we live. Yeah, and also I guess people just see themselves as defined in a political struggle and they sort of want easy markers for are you an ally and an enemy? And if you're taking what they very strongly believe in and seemingly trashing it, then you become an enemy and you go outside of the sort of people how, I need to talk to, you know? How, how much of that is to do with their psychological need for certainty, um, their need for a struggle, um, you know, their difficulty with indeterminacy um, uh, and with certain forms of complexity? You know, th I think there is a psychological level at which, yeah, so, I mean, cer certainly in terms of disability, hmm. because, you know, and I was wondering for a long time why I was getting this vitriol um, and attacks um, and then I thought to myself, well, you're challenging the social model of disability. And for many people, this is defining. This enabled them to escape from terrible ideas that they were rubbish, they were useless, that they had nothing to offer. And you're coming along and saying, we need to think again, and this might not work. And they're going, oh, my goodness, Shakespeare is attacking me. He's attacking the basis for my existence. And, of course, they were bitter and angry and, and, and hurt and, and emotional about it because they're human beings and they had made investments. And here was I, privileged Tom, rocking up and saying, I think you might be wrong about this. There's an, we're coming up on time, but one final element that's really interesting here is there was some research done. This is going to make sense, trust me. Um, or maybe don't trust me. But um, there was some research done by Theresa Bejan in Oxford, who's a uh, political theorist, on um, the ways religions historically have punished dissent. And one of the really clear findings that's true of all the big religions we know about, it's true of the different Christianities, it's true of the different Islams and so on, is that religions will go after apostates much harder than just generic non-believers. So if you're just like a Jew in Christian Europe, there will be a certain level of persecution. But the person who was a priest and then starts preaching a heresy, those are the guys you've got to get rid of. And I think there's a similar thing happens with political ideologies. That There's people, you know, I think like a lot of the people we're talking about, it would sort of never even occur to them to spend a lot of time going after and engaging strongly conservative figures. But if you're inside of the disability movement and you're seen as like an ally and a spokesman for it and you say something that challenges an orthodoxy in a weird way like the religion thing like the most dangerous thing to a religion isn't someone who's just always been a part of another religion the most dangerous thing is someone leaving your religion that's the bigger threat to the group and i think there's an element of that in political discourse that if you're seen as on the same side as someone and then you say something heterodox, that's when the venom comes out. I'm sure you're right. And again, I'm also sure that this is all about psychological processes. Yeah. You know, we know about the tribalism of the Labour Party and other left groups. Um, I think that it may... Here's a suggestion, that everybody has doubts. People have doubts about their position. And if you are, if you're in your language, a heretic, if you're, if you're voicing those doubts you're voicing the doubts that many people have at some level hmm. even if they haven't vocalized them or even brought them to consciousness they're there somewhere and you're saying this doubt is real hmm. this doubt is a reason for rethinking some of this 
and therefore you know you're dangerous you're 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 uh, uh, challenging people's certainties and uh you know you need to be denounced you need to be you know as you say back in the day burnt at the stake rejected uh, but it's about groups it's about identity it's about psychology and that's why uh you know we we, we need to have this in our thinking uh, we need a account of politics and of ethics uh, that takes into account uh, you know the le- limitations and preconceptions of our minds and so you know back at the beginning of this discussion uh, you know i was embarrassed and i said look i've read a lot of different things but i think we need a lot of different things we need political philosophy we need economics that you've mentioned we need psychology we need genetics we need all of these things not to reduce our complex human behavior and social interactions to one of those but to say they're probably all at play the 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 challenge you get to that and we'll end with this is i so believe that and like um i so believe that that is what's needed in our political thinking a sort of multi framework uh, an ability to think in a multi framework kind of way what people will say is but that's really challenging and that's all right for someone who's like an intellectual or something like that but most people can't put the time commitment in to think that way and they need a simple set of rules to go run with and that's sort of what these ideological things do i my view is that might be a little patronizing towards the average person and that if you give people a chance to think properly they might surprise you but the, i'm not i'm also not underrating the the the, the challenges of um asking people to think this way and and getting them to do it well well i gotta say yes and no and i think you're absolutely right everybody's capable of having this sort of complex thing we did a citizen's jury when i was in newcastle Hmm. and you know if you sit people down in a deliberative process it doesn't matter who they are they don't have to have any skills going into it or knowledge they will come out with sensible views if you give them time to discuss it you give them expert witnesses who can clarify and add you know expert adv- uh, information people come out well that you know that everybody so i I'm, i have a lot of faith uh, in the ability of people to to work it out but that's given a few days and a lot of resources exactly oh, you know and what happens is that we don't have that we need to make snap decisions uh, either in our daily life as ordinary uh, citizens or sometimes in policy arenas. I'll never forget that, you know, I, as you know, I've been looking at disability for 30 years or whatever it is. So, you know, and the more I read, the more I don't know. That's for sure. And I was at the WHO. I worked at the WHO for five years. And there was one point where I was about to talk to a bunch of really senior people, health policy makers, uh, possibly some ministers, I can't remember. It was it was a big thing. And and my my boss said to me, you know, what are you going to say? And, and I was telling him what I was going to say. And I said, well, to start with, I'm going to tell him it's complicated. Mm. And he said, no, let me stop you there. Never tell a policymaker it's complicated. Mm. They want to know it's simple. Here are the levers. Pull these and you'll get this outcome. And um, they... You know, life is complicated, but we reduce it to simplistic answers, either in our daily life or at the highest level. So these were very intelligent people, but they just wanted, tell me the answer, tell me what to do, I'll try and do it. Yeah, terrific. Um, should, we, should we pause there? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, let, well, let's leave you with a plug before we go. Um, if listeners are interested in you or your work, where should they go? Blog, website, Twitter handle, anything like that? Okay. Uh, um, farmerofthoughts.co.uk is my personal website. Mm-hmm. But if you're interested in uh, my work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, go to the website for ICED, the International Centre for Evidence in Disability, mm-hmm. and you'll find all the research we're doing uh, globally to try and promote uh, the interests of disabled people. Terrific. Um, thanks so much for doing this. I really right. appreciated having um, you on. Yeah, no, it was great fun, and thanks for doing it, and good luck. <laughs>